Welcome to Vatican Six. I'm your host, Titan. Let's get to it. We're going to turn to the latest on the urgent manhunt for a suspect in the murder of those four college students in Idaho. Police now say all four victims may have been asleep at the time of the attack. Kana Whitworth is there for us in Moscow, Idaho, with more. Good morning, Kana. Yeah, Robin, good morning. Authorities tell me the other two roommates who survived were also likely asleep, but that they were in the basement. And when they woke up, they thought a roommate had passed out, initially calling friends over, who discovered a much more sinister scene. This morning, police in Moscow, Idaho, revealing for the first time that before a 911 call was made, the two surviving roommates of a deadly rampage that killed four students summoned friends to the off-campus home, telling authorities they thought someone on the second floor had, quote, passed out and was not waking up. What I do know is that they woke up later in the morning. They recognized that something was amiss as far as they believed that the roommate uh, wouldn't, wouldn't wake up. They called some friends, the friends came over, they called 911, and that's when the officers arrived. Police say multiple people spoke with the 911 dispatcher before an officer arrived. You have victims with multiple stab wounds. How does that translate to my roommates passed out and won't wake up? So I haven't seen the scene and I'm not exactly sure what they saw in the morning, but what we believe we know is that when they woke up, they believed that the roommate was still passed out, wasn't, wasn't responding. And they was it responding friends. to what? I'm not sure. Detectives do not believe anyone at the scene was involved in the crime. This TikTok from inside the home showing all of the roommates together just weeks before. The survivors' faces blurred because police haven't released their identities yet. As the search for the killer intensifies, authorities say they're targeting certain neighborhoods looking for surveillance video and any new evidence. We're looking everywhere. Frantic for answers, Kernado's brother going door to door with flyers asking neighbors to search their properties. This is a horrible thing that's happened and somebody needs to be brought to justice. Meanwhile, Gonzalez's sister has been poring over phone records saying Kaylee made several calls to her longtime boyfriend the night she was killed. The calls went unanswered between 2.26 and 2.52 a.m. I know for an absolute fact that he is not a suspect. He is not suspicious. He is 100 percent innocent in this. And this morning, police confirming he is not a suspect, but they're still asking this tight knit community for information. And right now, authorities have conducted 90 interviews. They're chasing over 700 leads. But of course, all of this is happening, Robin, as Ethan's family is laying him to rest today. All right, Kana, thank you so much. We're going to bring in a ABC News contributor, former FBI agent Brad Garrett. And Brad, um, we heard in Kana's report, the, the police releasing those chilling new details. Two victims mm -hmm. were on the second floor, two on the third floor. All four are now believed to have been asleep at the time. The two roommates that were in the house in the basement. Uh, what, what does all this tell you, Brad? So it tells me that someone came into the house with a comfort level, that they probably knew the layout of the house. Uh, and I, I tell you, what's, what this new information, Robin, really sort of changes my analysis or profile of maybe who did this. And the reason why is that if you have basically four people killed on two different floors and the roommates go up and really don't realize that they've been stabbed, does that mean that the killer is actually staged? Did he cover them up in such a way that they didn't see the blood? And so as a result, is this a person maybe a little older? Think about how much time it would take to go to four different people and to kill them in the manner in which they were killed. So uh, what bothers me is that the circle of people that may have committed this, you may have to make bigger. You obviously look for people close to the victims initially, and that's absolutely correct but my my sense might be that this is somebody that's really not in their inner circle but we'll have to see okay so you're shifting your analysis do you think even though the police have stressed that this is ongoing it's going to take some time uh, how are they shifting the investigation do you think based on this new information well i would hope they're shifting it to looking at uh, after moving beyond immediate contacts, in other words, other, other college students, basically, boyfriends, girlfriends, etc., is that 
who else do they have relationships with? People, on, you know, adults on campus, people in the community, because you're going to actually have to start spreading out to people that they may have had just a casual relationship with. Because this person didn't just show up in this house and commit this act. He went there to do specifically what he had done. And, and it's, it's so clear to me that he really knew what he was doing, just based on the time alone, as I mentioned to you earlier. All right, Brad Garrett, thank you. I know we'll be checking back with you from, from time to time. And hopefully they do have some solid leads because the families of those four victims can only imagine what they're going through right now. Brad, thank you. Let's talk about it. What doesn't make sense to me is I don't understand how the two surviving roommates thought that if their fellow roommates and friends wouldn't wake up, that that wasn't an emergency. In most cases, you would call the police, 911, to get some sort of assistance. You wouldn't call friends. That's not to throw any shade anyone's way, the facts or the facts. The only reason I can think to call friends is they were afraid for some reason. I think that everyone there, including the victims that passed, should have drug tests. Their systems should definitely be checked. Another question I have is why didn't the killer go in the basement? Now they said he killed two people on one floor and two people on another set of floors. So two different floors, four victims, but he didn't go in the basement. So that seems kind of strange for him to stop, he or she, to stop at that particular point and not go downstairs. I find it hard to believe, if not almost impossible, that the roommates, the surviving roommates who found their friends didn't notice any blood. How is it possible that they didn't notice any blood, even if he killed them with a sheet on. You would you would expect there would be some kind of blood splashes or even a puddle from the body sitting there until however long it was from the time that they were killed to the time that they were found the following morning or the same morning. But even if there wasn't splashes, there would be some sort of blood on the wall or there would have seeped through the cover. I agree that the killer knew the layout of the house and felt a certain level of comfort in the house. He or she is definitely familiar and has been in that house previously. And I'm almost sure it was partying or over there visiting some of the victims that are no longer here. Another question, why did the killer choose that particular night? Out of all the nights, why did he choose that particular night? How did he know that they were going to be that inebriated that particular night? Another question I have, well, not really a question, a statement. I used to drink. And I know a lot of people who drink. And I mean, get really drunk. Not they self drunk. Can't walk drunk. Okay? That's not all of them, but some people. I have never been to a party or to a bar and went back to someone's house and we all was the same level of drunk and fell asleep. All of us fell asleep to where we could not get up at all. Nothing woke us up. That's a different type of drunk. That's why I think drug tests are definitely in order. With that being said, this is Vatican 6. I'm your host, Titan. Thank you for watching, and I'm gone.